We have a growing prevalence of chronic disease. When you have a chronic disease, you actually need more nutrition than someone without a chronic disease. And they also decrease the absorption of nutrients or the utilization of nutrients. What are the symptoms that people can identify in their own bodies for the most common nutritional deficiencies? Because when I was in medical school, we didn't learn about how to identify nutritional deficiencies unless it was scurvy or rickets or beriberi or pellagra. It wasn't like, right. what is the kind of low level insufficiency or deficiency symptoms for many common nutrients? So once I began to learn that, they were easy to spot. And in functional medicine, we actually now have a curriculum for a nutrition focused physical exam. So you can even identify not only symptoms, but physical signs of inadequate nutrition. So what, what, take us through what that looks like and what are the kinds of things people can identify for themselves for the common ones and, and, and we can kind of riff on that for a bit. Great. Yeah, I think one of the, you know, it's worth pointing out that one of the, the challenges here is that um, the body needs 40 micronutrients at least to function properly and if we don't get enough of any of them, everything kind of breaks down because nutrients are the fuel for every physiological process that happens in the body. And what's difficult about this is that, you know, if you, if you have a severe deficiency, uh, of vitamin C, for example, like you'll get scurvy and that's pretty obvious, you know, you're not going to miss yeah. that. Right. But if you have a, a mild deficiency of vitamin C, you might find yourself getting a lot of colds and flus and other types of infections. You might find your inflammation and oxidative stress has, is going up and that might manifest as like pain in your body and, you know, other symptoms that are not very easily, you know, unless you're a practitioner and you're aware of this kind of thing, trace back to a moderate or mild vitamin C deficiency. So um, I just want to start there because um, it, it's it's important to know that mild, you know, not getting enough of these things um, is not necessarily going to kill you, at least mm. not right away. In the short term. In the short term. In the short term, it could, it's going to increase your risk of all kinds of chronic diseases that do that are the leading causes of death um, in in the mm -hmm. U.S. now seven out of ten mm -hmm. of the leading causes of death are chronic diseases rather than acute mm -hmm. problems. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, if we start from just kind of the very basic things to look out for, I'd say fatigue and low energy would be at the top of the list. You know, there's so many people who just don't feel like they have enough energy to get through the day. And if I have a patient that feels like that, I'm, I'm going to be thinking about nutrients right off the bat. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that can vary for all of the B vitamins. B1 is really important for energy. B12 folate is important for energy. Um, magnesium is, is important for energy. Even vitamin D is important for energy. Yeah, so it's not really, sure. people don't tend to think about that very much, but. Like um, fibromyalgia and vitamin D go together, right? You get muscle soreness and absolutely. fatigue and depression. <laughs> like, yeah. So let's, yeah. I mean, let's just keep going down. So you, uh, low mood, so maybe not full on clinical depression, but you know, just, uh, mood swings or, or mood changes. Um, uh, certainly depression, anxiety, um, you know, lack of focus, and then the whole range of cognitive symptoms like brain fog, uh, difficulty with word recall, um, poor memory, uh, inability to focus for long periods. You know, if you go to your doctor and complain of this, they'll just pat you on the back and say, welcome to old age, you know, or that's just part of the normal aging process. I don't think it is. I, I, I mean, maybe to some extent, but what happens when we age is we're less likely to absorb a lot of the nutrients that are critical for brain function and cognitive health. So I would say that whole range of symptoms is, is important. Um, digestive symptoms, this is something that people often don't realize is that the gut is a smooth muscle. It's part of the nervous system. And um, just like every other system of the body, it needs certain nutrients to function properly. So um, we need uh, all of the fat soluble vitamins are important. The B vitamins are important. Zinc is, is, is important for the gut. And if you're not getting enough of those nutrients, your, your gut health is going to suffer as a result. And then I would say, um, you know, if you're feeling depleted and you're not really responding to stress very well, you're not very resilient. You feel like you're just continually, um, you know, catching the latest cold or flu, or you're just, you, you don't have a lot of uh, buffer for the daily stresses of life. 
um, then you definitely have to look at your magnesium levels as probably one of the most important nutrients that governs our stress response. All of the B vitamins, of course, are really critical. Uh, zinc and copper are really important for the nervous system. Uh, again, the fat soluble vitamins. Um, and then, you know, another one is both male and female hormone imbalances. So women who are dealing with, uh, issues around menstrual cycle, um, sexual vitality, uh, and then men also dealing with, with, uh, similar issues with sexual vitality and, and just, um, strength recovery and performance. Uh, the production of all of the sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and all of the ways that those hormones are converted uh, in the body depend on several different nutrients. And when you're low in those nutrients, then you're not going to get optimal conversion of those hormones. So the entire endocrine system will be affected. So I know I just basically rattled off the whole body, and, you know, most potential symptoms you could have, but that's the reality we're facing because like I said, nutrients drive all of those chemical, biochemical yeah. processes in the body. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot, but I sort of want to unpack that a little bit. So first of all, it's important for people to understand that vitamins and minerals and nutrients are so critical to every function of the body because they're helpers for all the enzymes. And enzymes are catalysts that convert one molecule to another molecule. And this is happening literally trillions of times a second in your body. So literally it's trillions of reactions a second in your body that all depend on having adequate levels of nutrients to make these chemical reactions run. And one third of your entire DNA codes for enzymes. Think about that. And that means that those enzymes are variable in the population and some people need more or less nutrients, but those are so critical to have the right amounts and the right forms of nutrients to make those enzymes work and make your biochemical machinery work. That's why they're so important. Well, it's Absolutely. Also and if I could just interject on that, like um, magnesium is a great example of that, right? We, you, <laughs> we, when we first started this, or you've been doing this for longer than me, but when I first started, the stat I saw was magnesium was a cofactor for 300 different enzymatic reactions. Yeah. About 10 years later, it was 450. And the most recent research I've seen is that it's now over 600. So what that tells us is it's already <laughs> a lot. But we're just barely even understanding, you yeah. know, the the extent to which these nutrients really provide that support to all of the enzymatic reactions happening in the body. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, I was going to say that. That's exactly what I was going to say. Like drugs work on a single pathway or a single enzyme. These compounds, magnesium, zinc, whatever, it works on literally hundreds of different enzymes. And things like vitamin D actually modulate gene expression and hormone regulation. And I mean, there's just so many different factors that they regulate in the body. So when you don't have the optimal levels, it's a problem. And so I get it all the time. Dr. Hyman, listen, I eat a whole foods diet. I eat healthy. Why should I take supplements? I mean, our hunter gatherer ancestors never had to take supplements. Why should I take supplements? And isn't just going to make expensive urine and why should I waste my money? And is it really worth it? And by the way, a lot of people think it's worth it because I think it's a 20 plus billion dollar supplement industry out there. So yeah. yes, some people obviously think so, but, but it is a question clearly um, that has been debated. It's certainly something that doctors are still in question about. And uh, uh, just as a little aside, I, I you know, often sort of would in lectures with doctors, ask doctors, you know, who recommends supplements to their patients? And very few people would sheepishly raise their hand. And I'm like, how many of you actually take supplements? And like 70 or 80% of the, the group would raise their hand. <laughs> so. <laughs> that's a great, and I mean, that's actually a great segue because I would say, I would say I was one of those people who asked whether supplements are, are worthwhile if I'm eating a nutrient dense whole food diet. And to be honest, Mark, in my heart of hearts, I, I wish the answer was no. You know, I wish that we could just get all of the nutrients we need from food because that is the way that human beings are designed to get nutrients. And you and I both agree that no matter what the answer to the supplement question is, a nutrient dense whole foods diet is the core foundation for optimal health. Like there's no debate. Yeah. There. Yeah. Honest, everyone I know who's thinking about this in the right way is on the same page there. But then yeah. the real question that you asked, which I think is the million dollar question is, if you are eating that kind of diet, might you still benefit from supplements? And I think the answer is unequivoc unequivocally yes at this point because of several factors. So number one is mm. that changes in soil quality. So I think you and I have talked about this before. You've written about this extensively, but um, we've seen over the last 50 years in particular 
changes to the to, to the microbiome of the soil. So it's the same mm -hmm. thing that happens to our that's happened to our guts. But in the case of soil, it's because of chemical fertilizers and pesticides and industrial agriculture and monocropping has changed the composition of the soil biome so that we're the plants are less able to extract nutrients from that mm -hmm. soil. Mm -hmm. And you've seen declines of anywhere from 20 to 40 percent or more in, across the, the board in vitamins and minerals. And one example I came across in a study that just really stood out to me and I've always remembered is we'd have to eat eight oranges today to get the same nutrition from a single orange that our grandparents ate. Wow. 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 That's just two generations. Of course, right? then we get diabetes, but that's another problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's that's part of what we're talking about here. We see an increase in like the sugar and sweet content of the orange, but a decrease in the nutrient value. So that's a double whammy. You get hit on both yeah. sides. So even if you're eating, you know, healthy food, you're not getting the same level of nutrition that even your grandparents got, much less the paleo ancestors that you referred mm -hmm. to. So, so that's mm -hmm. number one. Number two is something I also know you're passionate about was the shift from a local organic food system to an industrial food system that's global mm -hmm. in nature. Mm -hmm. And why that's important in terms of nutrient value is that as soon as you take a plant out of the ground, that it starts losing nutrients immediately. And so that's not a big deal if you're picking carrots out of your you know, backyard or picking a tomato off the vine, or maybe you're going to a farmer's market. Uh, where the food was just harvested that that morning or the day before, but if if you're eat, if you're like most people and you're going shopping in the grocery store for your produce, chances are that carrot might have traveled 1,800 miles, which is the average length that a carrot travels to get to the grocery store. Yeah, and yeah. by the, or it could have even come for. I mean, uh, you, in California, you can you get basil from Guatemala, um, so yeah. you know. By the time the food hits your mouth, it's 40 to 50% depleted just because of how we are growing and distributing food now uh, across the globe. So that's another yeah. big issue. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, one, I, I, well, I, before you go, I just sort of reflection on my own garden. You know, I, I go to the farmer's market. I go to a really kind of equivalent of like a local Whole Foods in the Berkshires where I live. And I buy the best organic broccoli and asparagus and it, tastes okay. It tastes good. But when I grow the asparagus in my garden and I pick it and I eat it literally within seconds, or when I take the broccoli from my garden and pick it and eat it, it's like, a, it's like an entirely different vegetable. <laughs> so the truth is most of what we're eating is already so depleted and the flavor that's in the plants comes from the phytochemicals and the nutrients in them. So it's not just that they taste better. It's that they actually are better. And I think yeah. that's what most people don't realize. Yeah, you could even see it in the color too, right? Because phytonutrients are what what provide the color. So you you mm -hmm. go to like the mm -hmm. grocery store and you buy a tomato, it looks pale and kind of waxy. You you bite if you were to bite into it or cut into it and and take a, a and taste it, it, it's like kind of like water, tomato flavored water or something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. I I you know when I was growing up, those were that's how tomatoes were. And then I I can still remember the time the first time I tasted a real tomato off of a vine. It was like an explosion in my mouth of tomato ness that I had never even experienced before. So this is a huge issue. And I think it's one of the biggest problems we face in terms of nutrient density. Uh, another big one is toxic, a growing toxic burden. So mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. heavy metals like lead and mercury and arsenic and cadmium in the food supply. Now we have, we're still seeing stories almost every week about lead and drinking water all over the country. Mm -hmm. We've got toxins like glyphosate and bisphenol A. And in addition to the effect that these toxins have on our bodies, um, they also bind to nutrients and they yeah. make those nutrients impossible to absorb. So that's a big problem that keeps growing. And then, you know, th there are several, I could go on and on, but I'm going to stop with this next one. We have a growing prevalence of chronic disease. Yeah. Uh, six in 10 Americans have a chronic disease and four in 10 have multiple chronic diseases. And you get hit on both sides with that one as well. So chronic diseases increase the demand for nutrients. So when you have a chronic disease, you actually need more nutrition than someone without a chronic disease. And they also decrease the absorption of nutrients or the utilization of nutrients. So let me give you an example. Uh, people with uh, obesity or diabetes, as you've, as you've termed it, 
Um, they are less likely to absorb vitamin D from food and they're less efficient at producing vitamin D from a given amount of exposure to sunlight. So someone who's obese might need to take 10,000 IU of, uh, yeah. per day of vitamin D just to maintain a normal level yeah. versus someone who's lean, maybe 2000 IU would be sufficient for them. So there's mm -hmm. all kinds of examples like that as well. So the truth is we're just not living in the world that our ancestors lived in. And when I finally was able to accept that and come to terms with it, you know, the question was, okay, do we, do I want to like hold on to this ideological stance, you know, that we mm. should be able to get nutrients from food and mm. suffer as a result yeah. of that and yeah. my patients yeah. suffer, or do I want to like figure out a way that we can close that gap and build on the foundation of a whole foods, nutrient dense diet with smart supplementation. And that's, that's where I've ended up in my career. I know that's where you've ended up in your sure. career as well. Sure. Well, I, you know, people say, Dr. Hyman, do I really need supplements? I said, no, I always say, I don't think anyone needs supplements, but only under certain conditions. First, they have to hunt and gather their own wild food. <laughs> Second, they have to be exposed to no environmental toxins, have no chronic stress, sleep nine hours a night, go to bed with the sun, wake up with the sun, drink pure clean water. And if that describes you, then no, you don't need supplements. But for the rest of us, I think we do. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. <laughs> you know, I think, and I, I think that, you know, you just hit, hit upon a couple of things that are worth emphasizing. You know, the, the, the quality of the food we're eating is so much less than it used to be. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the agricultural practices that degrade our soil. And it's the symbiosis between the microbes in the soil and the nutrients in the soil that makes them free to be absorbed by the plant. So if you have dead soil, otherwise known as dirt, which is what most of food is grown in America because of the chemicals we put on are essentially poisons. They're like antibiotics for the soil. They kill the microbial life of the soil. If you don't have those microbial compounds and the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil, the plants can't extract the minerals and the nutrients from the soil, which is why they're so much less nutritious. So, and the other thing I think that people don't realize is that climate change and increasing temperatures and carbon in the atmosphere is creating a bigger problem because it's causing the plants to absorb more carbon dioxide, which is a good thing. But what does that carbon dioxide turn into? Well, carbon carbohydrates, it's the same root, right? So it turns into a starchier plant. So by nature, the plants become less nutritious because they have more starchy carbohydrates, less protein and less nutrients. So we're kind of in this vicious cycle of a degrading food supply while we're seeing increasing needs for nutrients based on our increasing uh, toxic world, increased stresses, and this sort of vicious cycle you mentioned. Uh, plus, you mentioned the medication issue. I mean, that's another whole issue. Doctors always say, oh, don't take this nutrient. It can interfere with your medication. Well, the opposite is true. A lot of medications interfere with nutrients. And yes. so 81% of Americans are on some type of medication, and they are, they're often interactions. Like if you're on a diuretic for blood pressure, you lose magnesium. If you're on an acid blocker for B12, you can't absorb, I mean, for a uh, reflux you can't absorb b12 yeah. you know and metformin i could go on and, on. and, and folate metformin exactly of yep exactly so that's that's the whole issue um the other thing i sort of want to want to touch on is um you know this idea is can you really get your nutrients from food and i, I think uh, you know i i generally don't think so unless you're a complete ocd nut and i i <laughs> Not to disparage one of my patients, but I had this one patient. It's like Dr. Hyman. I figured out if I eat four Brazil nuts, twenty-five pumpkin seeds, and you know, four ounces of liver, and this, and she went on and on, like basically covered every nutrient and where it came from, and what amount of it was in each food, and how to. Eat. So she was like counting her nuts, literally. It's a full-time job, right? It's a full-time job, yeah. No, nobody <laughs> other than her and, and a few of our patients, we've had the similar kind of like, bring in the Excel spreadsheet, you know, where they check off the foods that they're eating. And and that's really what it does take often to yeah. to to get it right. And um, you know, most people are not gonna go through that to that level of effort for sure. Yeah, for sure. The other thing that I want to have you address next is this idea of are we really nutrient deficient? So yeah, the foods may be less nutritious, but I mean, how common are nutritional deficiencies in practice truly? And 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 why don't why don't we hear more about it? And I and I know I've had the luxury and privilege of being able to test tens of thousands of patients over decades for nutritional testing, and I do it on everybody as a baseline. It's like I check blood pressure, check you know check cholesterol, check heart rate, check their weight. It's checking the nutrient levels. And it's just astounding to me the level, and by the way, my practice 
is generally made up of people who are health conscious. They're not like I call them virgin patients who've been eating McDonald's their whole life. And I have a few of those and it's even more shocking. Yeah. But the level of nutritional deficiency, even among an educated, well-off, conscious population is still staggering. So can you just talk about the widespread nature of nutritional deficiencies, what, what we know about them and, and what they are, what are the most common ones? Yeah. Absolutely. And that's what opened my eyes to this as well. You know, uh, 15 years of treating patients and every patient that walks through the door gets a full nutrient analysis. And I can probably count on one hand the number of patients that had adequate levels of all nutrients in all of those 15 years, which is is really shocking for the same reason. I, I have highly motivated, educated patients who are way far above the, the, the norm in terms of the attention that they're paying to this. And they were still uh, not getting enough, and it was contributing to all of their symptoms. Everything from minor symptoms like fatigue and you know poor quality sleep and you know slight mood disturbances to full on disease, you know autoimmune disease and gastrointestinal mm. issues, yeah. thyroid problems, etc. I know you've seen the same thing. So uh, you know, let's just kind of zoom out and see like how do we even know how much <laughs> nu nu nutrients that we need uh, to thrive? Well, the answer is we don't have great data on that yet because most of the uh, scales, nutrient density scales and um, standards for how much we should get, like the recommended dietary allowance or RDA, were, does, you know, the RDA was designed in World War II when they were trying to figure out rations for soldiers. And yeah. that's certainly the question they were asking there was certainly not how can we optimize these soldiers health? They were asking how can we keep them alive during wartime? You know, how can we make sure they don't develop scurvy and rickets and these diseases of malnutrition? And uh, so that's one problem. You know, the, the standard that we're using is really only designed to prevent serious problems. It's not designed for optimal health. Even within that standard, though, that they often haven't been updated for, you know, 25, 30 years plus. A great example is magnesium. So the RDA for magnesium was last updated in 1997. And RDAs are based on body weight. So uh, if there's been a change in body weight over a given period of time, the RDA should be updated and go up. But it hasn't. So mm. in 1997, the, the, the average body weight for a, ma a female was um, about 135 pounds, and the average weight for a male was about 166 pounds. And the RDA was 420 milligrams per day for men and wow. 320 for women. Now today, wow. though, the average weight of a woman is 170 pounds, and the average weight of a man is 196 pounds. Wow. And wow. when researchers recalculated the RDA for magnesium based on this, it went up to 650 for men and 530 for women. And the average intake is only about 340 grams a day in, in this country. Wow. So that tells wow. us most people are, are getting 200 to 300 milligrams per day less magnesium than they need. But the, if you were to just go on the web and search for the RDA for magnesium, it's still 420 for men and 320 for women. It's, you know, for 25 years ago. So I think we're dramatically underestimating the rates of nutrient deficiency uh, for that reason. But even with all of these caveats, the latest nurses' health data show that the majority of Americans are deficient in not just one essential nutrient, but several. So I'll give yeah. you uh, some yeah. stats here. 100% yeah. don't get enough potassium. 94% don't get enough vitamin D. 92% don't get enough choline. 89% don't get enough vitamin E. 67% don't get enough vitamin K, 52% don't get enough magnesium. But as I just said, that's actually probably closer to 100%. Yeah. 44% uh, calcium, 43% vitamin A. I could go on, but these statistics are shocking because they show yeah. that most people are deficient in most nutrients, full stop. So how do we measure these? Because you know, when you go to the doctor, they don't go, oh, wow, we just checked your nutrient levels and they're all deficient. Um, in functional medicine, we have ways of testing them, but what, what are the most important diagnostic tests for nutrient deficiency that people should be focused on? Yeah. What are the most common ones? I mean, you mentioned a lot of them, but what, what are the things we actually want to test for and how do we test for those? So this is one of the biggest challenges, unfortunately, and you know this, Mark, from your practice, where um, 
it's very difficult. It would, what would be perfect is if there was like a single panel you could run with a single body fluid that would accurately test all <laughs> nutrients. <laughs> That's like the Holy grail. I, I wish I, you know, if there's one thing I've always wanted as a clinician that I never, that, that I've never had, it's that right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but you know, that if, uh, with each different nutrient, you have to test it differently. So for, for example, you can't really assess vitamin K2 in the blood accurately right now. Uh, there are yeah. some like surrogate markers you can use to estimate it levels, but you know, you're not at getting an accurate measurement with iodine. If you want to know long-term iodine status, you have to test it in the hair. If you do a urine test, you can see how much the patient has consumed in the past 24 hours, but that doesn't really tell you long-term yeah. status. Um, you know, nutrients like B12, if you do serum B12, you can, you can get a decent idea, but B yeah. serum B12 doesn't go down until stage three and four of B12 deficiency, which is the final mm -hmm. stage. So to get a more accurate assessment of early B B12 deficiency, you have to test methyl malonic acid or homocysteine. Um, so you get the idea. It's very complicated and it's rife with problems, which is one of the reasons why I think um, the estimates of nutrient deficiency are, are so, even as, as shocking as they are, are low because let's just take B12. If, if a clinician runs a serum B12 test and the B12 is, is low normal, they'll be told, hey, your B12 is normal. But if, if I was mm. to then run homocysteine or methylmalonic acid on that patient, yeah. Yeah. they're way out of range. That already tells us that that patient's not getting enough B12 and they're already experiencing significant effects of that. So, you know, it's, so I think the most, yeah, go ahead. So, so what are the top, like top nutrition tests and what are the ones we should be telling everybody to get that are going to reveal the most relevant deficiencies? Yeah. I mean, I think just to, to keep it simple and, and even with the stuff that's available from every local doctor, vitamin D would be at the top of the list, right? So, so vitamin D3, right? Because yeah, a lot of doctors D3. will measure vitamin D, not, not measure the right vitamin D. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's measure that. Uh, 25D and uh, pretty much, you, you know, you should be able to get this with, you know, every doctor's office insurance. Um, I think serum magnesium as, as imperfect as it is, because it's only measuring the, the half a percent of magnesium that exists in the, in the blood, not the night, you know, the rest of the magnesium is, is locked inside of the cells and tissues. So it doesn't show up in the serum, but mm. y you know, you can kind of generally assess where it is. That's mm -hmm. really important because magnesium is a critical nutrient. Um, just, just don't, you know, rely 100% on that. If you have other mm -hmm. symptoms of not getting enough magnesium and your serum magnesium is normal, I would, I would still, you know, follow up on that. I, we, I run B12 and folate, um, on every patient in part because they're so important for the health of the nervous system and the brain. And, and obviously we're suffering from epidemics there, uh, with brain and nervous system conditions. And so many of the drugs, as you pointed out, Mark interfere with B12 and folate absorption. So it's very typical for me to see, uh, B, low B12 and low folate in the serum. Uh, I run homocysteine. Oh, well yeah. You, so you run those other tests too, the homocysteine, methylonic exactly. acid. Yeah. yeah. So I run better indicators. serum homocysteine and that doesn't just tell you about B, folate and B12. It, it tells you about your inflammatory status. So that, I think that's a really helpful marker. It's a risk factor for cardiovascular disease and then urine and serum methylmalonic acid as another way of checking B12 status. I do zinc and copper on every patient, uh, you know, copper, Excess copper is associated with uh, dementia and Alzheimer's and a bunch of other neurodegenerative conditions. And zinc is critical for our brain function and immune function, which is particularly relevant these days. So I always want to assess zinc levels and see where that, uh, where that is. Um, serum cal you know, calcium uh, is difficult to measure in, in blood because it's so tight. It's, it's so tightly regulated in the blood that if our intake drops, the body will just pull calcium out of the bone in order to maintain a normal blood calcium level. And that's of course why low calcium intake in the diet leads to osteopenia and osteoporosis. Uh, so for calcium, we just, we use chronometer, uh, which is just a way that patients record what they eat very carefully over a three day period. 
And then that gives us a, an idea of how much calcium they're getting on a daily basis. It should be, you know, a thousand to 1200 milligrams a day, uh, depending on, uh, you know, age and, 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 you know, whether they're pregnant, et cetera. Um, and if they're not, then we need to look at other ways of getting calcium. So that's a pretty simple approach with mostly tests that are available from any doctor and then one way of assessing a nutrient that you could do on your own with a simple app. So, so that's really, really helpful. You know, in my experience, I would sort of add one thing, which is the omega check, which is an omega-3 fatty acid test that I find really helpful because 90 plus percent of Americans are deficient in omega-3s or have an excess of omega-6s. And you can really see that rather than having an abstract conversation about it. Yeah. I think just to summarize what you said, 25 hydroxy vitamin D available everywhere. Magnesium, sphere magnesium, I also would say red cell magnesium, even though maybe a little bit better, I think, and what's the optimal range? Because often the ranges are too wide and not ideal, yep. right? I think B12 folate, you know, methylonic acid, homocysteine for B12 folate status. I think copper zinc and copper zinc ratios are important, as you mentioned. Uh, selenium is another thing you can easily get yep. on a blood test. Vitamin A you can get. Uh, you know, I like to measure carotenoids or beta carotene, which is a, sort of a, a way to tell people eat vegetables or not. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> yeah. basically they, have, yeah. they can measure basically their blood levels. Uh, and, and so these are the kind of things that are available through a regular Quest laboratory or LabCorp lab that are available to your doctor. The problem is most doctors don't order them. They don't know what to do with them. They don't understand them. That's right. And, and they're not, they're not paying attention, but just because they're not looking for it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And I think this is really one of the big challenges we're facing is how do we get people educated about what their own personal status is and how do you address that? Like you said earlier, most of the nutritional guidelines are around addressing deficiency diseases, which we found 120 years ago. And we're still basing our nutritional recommendations on that instead of what do our bodies need to optimally function? Hence the word functional medicine. And yeah. Robert Heaney was a vitamin D scientist who wrote a brilliant article years ago called Long Latency Deficiency Diseases. So he says, well, if you don't have enough vitamin D in the short run, you get scurvy. If you don't have optimal levels in the long run, you get osteoporosis or depression or muscle weakness, right? If you don't have enough folate in the short run, it's an acute deficiency, you'll get anemia. But in the long run, you might get cancer or heart disease or depression or dementia, right? So it's a really different way of looking at these nutrients. So what is the optimal levels? And that, that sort of begs the question of the testing. We went back to, uh, we talked about earlier, which I think, you know, there, there's a company that I've become the chief medical officer of called Function Health, which is designed to empower people with their own health data, with their own health information, be able to do $15,000 worth of diagnostic testing for 500 bucks or less than 500 bucks, and, and get your numbers, including a lot of these nutrient levels we're talking about, and then learn what to do about them. And not just what the reference ranges are, but what are the optimal ranges? Like vitamin D, you say, well, if it's less than 20, that's a problem. Or some labs say less than 30, but it should be over 45 or 50 to be in the optimal range, right? So we're, we really have to kind of rethink what we're doing. Yeah, you know, Mark, there's another issue when it comes to nutrients that I think we should talk about that I don't think gets enough airtime, and that's nutrient synergy. So nutrients don't exist. They don't exist in isolation in the body. As you well know, they play synergistic roles. And you could have adequate levels of one nutrient. Let's say iron, you're getting enough of it in your diet. But if you're not getting enough of the nutrients that support iron absorption and metabolism, then you could still be iron deficient. So, for example, copper. We know that you need copper is needed for iron to, you know, to be utilized and absorbed. And if someone's copper deficient, they could be iron deficient even if they're getting enough iron. We know magnesium is needed for the biosynthesis and transport of vitamin D. So even if you're getting enough D, if you're not getting enough magnesium, you're gonna have problems there. And I mean, the list goes on and on, but the point is that nutrients operate in this synergistic relationship. So we have to make sure we're getting enough of all nutrients, not just individual nutrients. Yeah, it's true. I just think even one organ like thyroid, Right. For the thyroid hormone to be made, you need iodine. For the T4, which is the inactive hormone, to be converted to the active hormone, you need selenium. selenium For the yeah. T3, which is the active form, to bind to the nuclear receptor to have its action, you need vitamin D3. So it's like you need, you need all these different things. They work as a team. And, and so what's so crazy about modern nutrition and supplement research is they single out one nutrient that they think might be beneficial and they study it alone. 
And I'm like, well, if Michael Jordan was the best basketball player in the world, if he was on an NBA team by himself, he would lose every game. <laughs> it doesn't, <laughs> yeah, it's like, that's right. Yeah, so, it just, but you know, it that's, as you well know, that's, that's an artifact of drug research, right? And you right. want to, they want to isolate the single compound and then control all the other variables and keep them similar. But that's, that's not how functional medicine works. That's not how the body works. Uh, it's really a complex symphony of interactions all the time. And they work literally on hundreds of different pathways and enzymes. And I mean, each nutrient can have literally hundreds of different effects in the body and be involved in hundreds yeah. of different processes. So it's important to and make we're, sure we're we, still yeah, learning I, I about that, right? Yeah. It's just crazy. I mean, I think we're just scratching the surface on yeah. understanding because it's so complex that we have just applied our kind of reductionist, you know, uh, framework, allopathic framework to try and understand these nutrients. And, and there are some researchers out there like uh, Gregory Scrinis and others who are looking at food synergy as this complex web of interactions. And, and maybe even with AI and some of the new tools that we're going to have available to us, we'll be able to figure some of this stuff out. But the, just for listeners, you know, anyone watching or listening, the important, this is why we're so, you know, Mark and I are such big fans of getting as many nutrient needs as you can, as you can meet through food, because food has those you know, when you eat a food, it doesn't just have one nutrient. It has multiple different nutrients. And often food <laughs> contains the actual nutrients that support the other nutrients in that same food. Yeah. That's nature's intelligence, it's right? So it's so true. It's so true. So it's so funny people ask me, well, can I take all these supplements at once? I'm like, I said, do, do, do your body know what to do? I was like, listen, do you realize how many molecules are in the food you eat? How many phytochemicals? <laughs> yeah. Hundreds and hundreds of vitamins, minerals, all these different kinds of compounds your body has to totally deal with. Your body is super smart and knows what to do with all of it. So that's right. Well, let's, let's talk. Let's talk about another concept here. I think you know there's a lot of fear sometimes about oh taking too much or overdosing, and 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 there are certain nutrients which you have to be careful of, and there's others that doctors you know might do a blood test on someone taking B12 and go oh my god you're B12 toxic you know stop it right away and I'm like well no you you really can't be B12 toxic only if you don't take enough yeah. folic acid and so so right. there are certain things you have to be careful of. For example, the uh, the Inuit uh, would know that if if the foreigners uh, the explorers back in the day, they, they were, they didn't like them because they were <laughs> disrupting their culture. They would feel them, feed them polar bear liver, which had huge amounts of vitamin A in it. And they would get vitamin A poisoning and they would die. <laughs> so yeah. you have to be careful of some nutrients. So tell us about the ones we have to be careful of. That's true. So you, you mentioned vitamin A. Um, I, I think that vitamin A is a concern at extremely high doses, but it's worth noting that having adequate levels of vitamin D and K2 really increase the toxicity threshold of vitamin A. So mm. put another way, if you're deficient in D and K2, the, you're going to get toxic uh, effects of vitamin A at a much lower uh, dose. Whereas wow. if you're getting yeah. enough K2 and D, you have to really, like you would have to be supplementing with crazy amounts of vitamin A, or you'd have to be eating polar bear liver or you know, lots of beef liver every day for that yeah. to be a concern. Yeah. Um, vitamin D, you know, you can overdo it with D. I almost hesitate to even mention it because 94% of Americans don't get enough. So yeah. Yeah. we're not talking about a common problem here. I just want to emphasize that, you know, most people are not on that end of the spectrum, but right. you and I have both seen people in the clinic who come in and they've been taking 50,000 IU of vitamin A a day for like years and or vitamin their, D, their level is, vitamin D, or vitamin D, right. And yeah. their serum level is like 140. Well, that is toxic and that can increase the risk of kidney stones and heart disease, et cetera. But at the doses that most people take, let's say 5,000 IU per day, there's almost no risk of toxicity. Yeah. It's and true. Most people. I mean, you're right. You're right, Chris. I think, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what the ideal vitamin D level is. And in the way we look at nutrients, we talked about this before, is that it's, it's a bell curve, which is what's normal for the population. Yeah. But if 80% of the population is low in vitamin D because we live and work inside, your normal level would be 20 or 30. But that's not the actual ideal level. That might not be optimal. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, and, the, and the reality is that, that uh, you can tolerate a lot higher doses. Even the upper range of what they call normal, like 100 on some tests or 75, is not really toxic at all. In fact, 
uh, Dr. Robert Heaney, did, it was a vitamin D expert, did a study where they looked at 10,000 units a day for three months in healthy young males. And there was no harm at all from that dose, which is a lot. It's way more than I give most yeah. patients. Uh, so, yeah. it, you know, if you're a lifeguard, your level might be 200, <laughs> you know, which is, right. is you know, so, so I think people shouldn't worry about too much vitamin D unless you're doing stupid doses or you're not taking a brand that's reputable. Because some, sometimes the brands will say, oh, 5,000, but it might, they might have not tested the product. Yeah. It's, I have some crazy patients who tend to overdo it. So I've seen a couple cases, but I, I don't think it's a concern for most people. As we said, nine, almost 95% are deficient. So that's a far bigger problem. Uh, calcium, I definitely have concerns about, um, but not from dietary calcium, but from people taking too much supplemental calcium. There are studies showing that can increase the risk of kidney stones and, and even heart disease. Uh, because when you take it in really large doses as a supplement, it ends up in the blood and the yeah. body doesn't really know what to do with that. It doesn't get into the bones and the teeth where you want it. It gets into the soft tissues instead. So that's a yeah. problem. Uh, yeah, I don't know iodine. about you, Chris, but I, I never recommend calcium supplements. <laughs> I don't. I mean, I, I used to because that's what I learned to do as a doctor. Yeah. Like 1,500 yeah. milligrams a day. But it's really not about yeah. how much calcium you're taking in. It's about how much is being absorbed about your vitamin D levels and about how it's being used. And and in countries, for example, in Africa, where they have like very low vitamin D, I mean, uh, calcium intakes like 300 or 400 milligrams a day. They, they don't have any osteoporosis because they, they have lots of, of, of other benefits that they have. In their and this, this is a great example of nutrient synergy. So vitamin D, vitamin K2, and magnesium all support calcium regulation and help calcium get into the bones and teeth where it's needed and keep it out of the soft tissue. So there's speculation, like Chris Masterjohn, our colleague, has written about this. He's speculated that if you consider nutrient synergy and someone has optimal levels of D, K2, and magnesium, the R, the RDA for you know the recommended amount of calcium might be more like 500 milligrams a day instead of right. 1,000 or 1,200, which is what's recommended right now. And that's total, including diet. That's right? including that, diet, yeah. Right, so not right. supplementing with that amount. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Uh, iodine is, is one of those kind of Goldilocks ones because uh, you know for most people they they get an, they can get enough iodine from diet or supplementation, but for someone with Hashimoto's. Iodine supplementation, particularly at higher doses, might be problematic, especially if they don't have enough selenium. So yeah. this, you know, that's another thing. To, and then iron, I, you know, again, iron deficiency, way bigger problem. Affects 2 billion people around the world, iron deficiency anemia. Even in the U.S., you know, it's still a big problem. But it's worth noting that Hemochromatosis, which is a, a genetic condition that causes excess iron storage, is the most common genetic condition of, in people of Northern European descent. It affects one in 200 people. So that's not a small number of people in a country with 300 million people. And, you know, I, I test, I do a full iron panel on everyone who comes into the clinic, and I see iron overload all the time. Do me too. I, I I diagnose it so often; it's crazy. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah. why did nobody ever pick this up on you before? <laughs> That's right. People could have it for decades and not even know it. So, so yeah, I, I'm not a big fan of iron supplementation typically, unless there's a reason. You know, unless we see that that patient has anemia or something like that. Even then, I'll often recommend liver or spleen. You know, organ consuming organ meats if they're willing to do that because that can really boost iron levels. But it's a food based form of iron, so I think the body is able to, you know. Uh, regulate the absorption of it better than with iron supplements. Yeah. So we've got vitamin A, vitamin D, iodine, um, calcium, and calcium, and then and, and then there's iron. a bunch more iron, and yeah, then we also so other fat soluble vitamins. Uh, maybe can you get vitamin too much K E, or alpha, e? alpha yeah. tocopherol? Yeah, yeah. There's studies suggesting that long term high dose supplementation with uh, with alpha tocopherol, which is the more common form of vitamin E has been associated with increased risk of prostate cancer in men and heart disease as well. Um, yeah. it, again, this, the, those are just at doses that we wouldn't encounter in nature. You know, like yeah. more is not always better. <laughs> we have right. to, to get out of that thought process in, in this country. Yeah. You know, with it, what happened was they saw that vitamin E deficiency was, was correlated with, you know, a lot of problems, people not getting enough vitamin E in their diet. And they figured, oh, hey, if we just – jack that way up, maybe we can prevent some of these problems. But of course, the pendulum swung too far in the other direction. So I don't recommend supplementation with alpha tocopherol at all. Tocotrienols no. are a different story. They're, 
a new form of vitamin E that's been recently discovered that doesn't have that long-term safety risk and they have some unique benefits and effects. Uh, and in fact, I included a, a tocotrienol product in my supplement line for that reason. But yeah. uh, re regular tocopherols that you find in most multivitamins and supplements, I'm not a big fan of, of supplementing with them either. Yeah, well, I want to get into the forms of nutrients in a second because, you know, I think it's a really important topic that most people yeah. don't understand, which is it's not just taking any old vitamin. It's what is the form of the vitamin? How bioavailable is it? How uh, is it? actually absorbed is it in a form that's actually can be broken down and used by the body and, and there's so many other variables yeah. we'll get into just to yeah. kind of close that loop on the what we should be careful of i think selenium some minerals I was are just tricky. About to say selenium like yeah. selenium you got to be careful with don't want to eat too many brazil yeah. nuts <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah but, or, or even, you know, some supplements have like 300 mil micrograms of selenium, and that's going to be too much for most people. Uh, it's definitely a Goldilocks range for that one, for sure. Uh, it, it's one of the more toxic minerals. But some mag magnesium, for example, unless you have kidney failure, you know, it's just going to be diarrhea. It's not toxic. So there's, right. there's, it's kind of confusing. Some vitamins are bad. Some minerals are bad to, to overdose. Oh, others are not. Like you can take all the, you know, vitamin B vitamins you want, and you're just going to pee them out. Your body's yeah. not going to, you know, uh, we, sh we, sh we should mention potassium. You don't want to overdo it on potassium because it plays an important role in, in muscle contraction, including the, contr the, the heart contraction and action potential and cellular uh, communication. And so, you know, getting plenty, you know, our ancestors got up to 10,000 milligrams of potassium in their diet and they, that's no problem. But if you're supplementing, you should not be taking, you know, gram level quantities of potassium, I think, because that, that can be problematic. All right. Well, let's talk about the forms of nutrients now, Chris, because, you know, people go, well, you know, I can go to Costco or I can go to CVS or Walgreens and just pick up the cheapest vitamin. It's a vitamin. What's the difference? I got everything in there. It's fine. What, what is the problem with that doing that? And why should we be more diligent about the quality of the supplements we're taking? And why does it matter? Both in terms of the actual form of the nutrient, but also what else is in that right. vitamin in terms of fillers, right. uh, you know, gums yeah. and yeah. flavorings and colorings and all this stuff. Like, it's kind of crazy. Why? I mean, you go to buy Centrum and it's like blue. I mean, why do you want to right. take blue dye for like 30 years? I'm like, I don't yeah. want to take blue, anything with blue dye. I mean, if it's blueberry, I'll yeah. take it. But it's like, that's right. Blue, That's right. It's the not blue pill and the red pill. I'm like, you don't need a blue pill or red yeah. pill. Vitamins yeah. shouldn't have colors except they're natural color. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, I mean, I think uh, the forms of the nutrients, oftentimes um, products will use synthetic uh, forms because they're a lot cheaper, you know, to put in there. And the problem with that is in many cases, those forms are foreign to the body. The body has not encountered those forms of those nutrients historically and doesn't know how to digest and absorb and process them effectively. So uh, some good examples here would be uh, folic acid. Uh, you know, is a, is a synthetic form of folate and it's, um, you know, some people are able to convert that into uh, methyl tetrahydrofolate, which is a more active form of folate that we want. But in, in, in quite a number of people, that conversion doesn't work well and they can end up with unmetabolized folic acid in their blood. I'm and one that's of those. been linked <laughs> to cancer and other health problems. Yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you a story about that, Chris. I I I, I just yeah, interrupt you for a sec. It's a interesting story. I, I I was in this movie Fed Up, which was released in 2014 yep. about the food system and obesity and kids. And the director of the film uh, was not a patient, but she was she, she talked to me about uh, this problem that she had, where she would have recurrent miscarriages, and and she couldn't get to have a baby, and she ended up having a pregnancy, but had uh, almost a full term anencephalic baby, which means like no brain basically. Oh man. And it was just yeah. horrible. And so she read this article that I wrote years ago on methylation. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's basically the chemical reaction that is happens all the time in the body that's facilitated by certain enzymes that require B12 folate, B6 and a bunch of other stuff. And so she read the article and there's a gene like you mentioned that people can't convert from the folate you eat in your diet to the methylfolate that you need to run everything. And she said to her doctor, "Hey, I, I think I might have this." And he, she asked for the gene test. And sure enough, she had the gene that was the funky gene that prevented her from metabolizing this properly. And then the doctor said, okay, I'm just going to give you some folic acid. And she's like, no, no, no. Dr. Hyman says I need to take methylfolate. <laughs> so she did. And, yeah. and, and it was quite amazing because during the, the, 
the movie uh, premiere and in the PR on the movie, I was traveling around New York City with her and she had this 10 month old beautiful baby boy with her that she was taking care of on her, on her little film tour. And it was just such uh, a beautiful story of how powerful yeah. these nutrients are and why it's so important to get the right one and the right one for you. Absolutely. So yeah, that's a great example. And so many women have, have benefited from that uh, same kind of approach and, and, and where they've taken folic acid that hasn't worked or even caused harm. They've switched over to 5-MTHF, which is the more active form, or even folinic acid, which is a more active form, and they do well. So, you know, exactly. that's that's one example. Uh, cyanocobalamin is another example. That's a form of B12 that's often in, in cheaper B12 products. And again, some people do just fine. They're able to convert that into methylcobalamin or adenosylcobalamin, which are the more active forms, but other people cannot. And they can take cyanocobalamin all day long and they don't experience any of the benefits that they would get if they were taking one of the more active forms like yeah. methylcobalamin. Yeah, exactly. So, and then, you know, vitamin A, um, beta carotene is, the, you know, is a, a less active form of the active form retinol. And carotenes have some important functions in and of themselves in the body. So I'm not saying carotenes are bad, but, uh, and, and a lot of people can convert carotenes into retinol, but there are some people who can't do that very well. And there are even some who can't do it at all. So mm. if you ever have seen someone who does like a carrot juice fast and then their oh. palms turn orange. That was me. That is one of those people. <laughs> <laughs> I did that years ago. I'm like, I was drinking tons of carrot juice before I kind of got the message that sugar wasn't so great. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah. this is healthy. It's carrot juice. I literally, I'm like, wow, I look like I'm like, you know, the it's orange like man. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, like, or, yeah, I've been in a tanning bed. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's, that's, that can happen. Um, less act, uh, vitamin K1, which again is important. It has some important roles on its own that can be converted into K2, but not always. So it's helpful to take vitamin K2, uh, preform alpha linolenic acid, which is a precursor to EPA and DHA, the long chain omega-3 fats, yeah. only about half a percent of that gets yeah. converted into EPA and DHA. So, yeah. you know, people who are supplementing only with like flax oil, they could end up being uh, deficient in D DHA, even yeah. if they're consuming a ton of that stuff. So th those Absolutely. are some of the main examples. Yeah, a lot of people who are vegan will supplement with, for example, the omega-3s from plants like walnuts or flax seeds, yeah. and, and they don't convert. And I test everybody's essential fatty acid levels, and it's just shocking. You see high alpha linoleic acid, linoleic acid and then really low EPA, DHA, which are the active important forms that you need for your brain function, inflammation, yeah. and regulating all these different functions in your body. And it just, they just can't make it. So it's really important. And then, and then besides that, Chris, you know, there's also the problem, not just the form of the nutrient from its bioactive form, but even from its absorption. Uh, for example, magnesium, we talked about with 700 That's enzymes, right. magnesium citrate and glycinate and three and eight and all these other forms are well absorbed, but oxide is not, but it's also the cheapest form yeah. of magnesium. So that's what's in right. most of the supplements you get yeah. in a grocery store or Walgreens or cheap supplements. And I'm like, sure, you got magnesium in the label, but it's not, it's like not working. Yeah. And you, there are things you could do, like you can chelate it and make it a buffered form, or you can turn it into a, a bisglycinate and make it well absorbed. But just the standard magnesium oxide is just going to go right through you, <laughs> literally. Yeah. Like, yeah, and exactly. that's what happens when people take too much magnesium oxide and they use it as a laxative. And mm -hmm. it might work for, as a laxative, but it's not working as uh, a magnesium supplement because it's, it's, it's literally going through you. And then, as you mentioned, Mark, you know, there's a lot of products that just contain a lot of stuff that you don't want to be putting into your body, um, you know, on a yeah. regular basis, all the, all the dyes and the um, artificial compounds and things like that. So it, like lactose you know, and gluten people sometimes and all say, kinds of oh, stuff. Well, they say, like, you know, oh, it's cheaper. It's, you know, it's 20 percent cheaper or whatever. But I'm like, OK, if you're not getting any benefit, then you're you're it's, you know, the difference between $22 and $24, like if you're getting a benefit from the $25 or $24 product, but no benefit from 22, what's the more expensive product? Really? It's the, exactly. it's the one that you're paying almost as much for, but getting no benefit from at all, or even being harmed by. It's sort of like that, you know, if you get a car with 10 miles per gallon or a car with a hundred miles per gallon, you know, it's like, it didn't matter. Right? So um, let's talk about That's something right. else. Cause it, I think, especially I think over time. 
I want to talk about this sort of next topic I'm, I'm really interested in hearing from you about is phytochemicals and phytonutrients. It's one of my favorite topics to talk about. And the more I learn about it, the more excited I get. It's really where the food is medicine conversation comes in. And, and you can get these from food, but you can also get these from, uh, from various supplements and, and different forms. Uh, you know, why are they so important? And, and, and I also want you to touch on the idea that, that, um, you know, it is important because there's a lot of people who, who are embracing a eating philosophy that I have some concerns about that can be very therapeutic in the short term, but it's people who only yeah. eat meat, the carnivore diet, meaning they don't eat any vegetables. Yeah, carnivore. It, yeah. And, and I mean, it's sort of the opposite of vegan, right? It's like only animal products. <laughs> So I, I wrote an article a while back called What's the Optimal Human Diet? And I did a really deep dive on this topic. Cause, and I looked at it from through different lenses. So if like if we study ancestral diets and human populations from all over the globe from different time periods, what can we determine from that in terms of the best mix of foods? What can we determine from clinical research, actual, you know, randomized controlled trials? And then what can we determine from observational nutrition research? which is pro highly problematic, as we both know, but you can still glean some important, you know, patterns from that. And all, when, no matter what, which of those three lenses you look for, I came to the conclusion that the optimal human diet contains a combination of plant foods and animal foods in some, some combination. Now, what that specific ratio of plant versus animal foods is can vary from person to person, culture to culture. There are examples of cultures that have extremely high intake of animal foods with a fairly low intake of plant foods that works really healthy, like the Inuit, for example. Then you have examples on the other end of the spectrum of like the Tukasenta in pa Papua New Guinea, who consume almost entirely plant foods, but then went out of their way to, to obtain just even a small amount of highly potent animal foods because they understood that that balance was important. And then you have everything in between, you know, where people consume you know, sort of more rough, roughly even percentage of calories from animal and plant foods. And the reason that yeah. that's important is that we get different nutrients from different foods. So the essential vitamins and minerals tend to, are often higher in animal foods. So organ meats, for example, are really high in zinc and iron and choline and B12 and folate and all of those essential vitamins and minerals. But the plant foods tend to be higher in the, in not surprisingly, the phyto, which, which means plant, in the plant yeah. forms of nutrients yeah. like carotenoids and flavonoids and lignans and beta glucans and all of these nutrients that, you know, 50 years ago, we knew very little about their impact on yeah. human health. But when you look in the scientific literature in the past 10 to 20 years, you just see that even though these are not currently thought of as essential, meaning we can't live without them. You can technically live without them, but you're not going to live a very good life if you're not getting a lot of them, and you're not going to live a very long life, most likely. That's right. I mean, I just came back from Ikaria in Greece, and it was amazing what they ate there. And they ate so many wild foods, Chris. And they had uh, one staple in their diet, which was wild sage tea. And, and all these oh, wild wow. herbs growing everywhere. And I was like, what is this wild sage stuff? So I kind of looked it up. I found the you know plant name for it and got all geeky about it. And it literally is very, very rich in, in, in catechins, which are the uh, compounds in green yep. tea that are so beneficial for green longevity, tea. for age, healthy aging, for detoxification as an antioxidant. Yeah, they help detox, you know, yeah. heavy metals, blood sugar. So that it's quite fascinating to see how these staple plants in these cultures are so important, especially those who live to be 100. Because in Icaria is one of the blue zones where people live to be well over 100. And they have wild greens. I mean, you go to any restaurant, they have like wild greens on the menu. I'm like, how do they do this? And they just go out and pick <laughs> greens everywhere. And I'm like, there's summer greens, there's winter greens. Right. So I think the phytochemicals are so key. But, you know, what really is exciting to me, and this is an interesting conversation we haven't really had, but I, I met this guy named Fred Provenz. I've had him on the podcast twice. He's written a lot about this. And Stephen Van Vellette also, who's now at the Utah State is, uh, and was yeah. at Duke, has done a lot of work looking at grass-fed animals <clears throat> eating a wide variety of plants that have high levels of phytochemicals in their meat and milk which is mind blowing. And they found, for example, if certain goats are eating certain shrubs, like, you know, the, whatever I just mentioned about the, the, the wild sage, that they have as high levels of catechins, for example, as green tea. So in a way, we're seeing phytochemicals in animal foods, which we never thought before existed. Absolutely. 
And then it seems to be more interesting is that they get metabolized to different forms that may be even more effective, right? That's right. Yeah. And, and, you know, the animals are doing the work for us. And in many cases, the animals do that work more efficiently because that's the food that they're designed to eat. Grasses and other plants that we couldn't even digest if we were to eat those. And we certainly wouldn't extract all of the nutrients from them. And you can even see this just like on a very basic level, if you're eating pasture raised eggs and you have your own chickens, let's say in your own backyard yeah. or you're getting them from the farmer's market, you'll see the color of the yolk change throughout the year as those chickens are eating different compounds. You can even see that in milk and taste the flavor of the milk change if you're, if you're getting milk from pasture raised cows. So yeah, that's a really important um, thing to understand. It's not just what we eat, of course, it's what yeah. anything that we eat that also eats is eating right, like right animals, exactly you know pasture raised animals but yeah just going back to the yeah. carnivore thing uh, you know i think you and i are on the same page here like i i've i've had paul saladino on my podcast who's a big proponent of the carnivore diet um sean baker i've talked to i, I i'm I, I try not to be dogmatic about these things just keep an open mind and You know, I've had patients who've been suffering from severe autoimmune disease who've done a carnivore diet and have had a miraculous response. So I just want to at least acknowledge that that happens. And, you know, I don't begrudge, I I don't judge anybody who is in that situation for for pursuing that approach because it can be life changing. And and, um, I, I totally understand why someone would do that. At the same time, that doesn't mean that it's the best strategy to follow long term. You know, there are lots of things that we do to improve our health in the short term that are not sustainable long term. How about like fasting? Fasting, is, <laughs> they, call it the cure, they call it the cure for all disease, right? But you, yeah. uh, it's pretty obvious that you can't fast for the rest of your life or your <laughs> life will example. be very, very short. <laughs> so yeah. I think I kind of tend to think of carnivore diet almost as, a, as, as that kind of approach, like a, yeah. almost a, a, a very intensive um, gut rest where most of the food's being absorbed pretty high up in the small intestine and it gives the colon and the large, large intestine a rest and, and maybe some stuff happens there that's pretty similar to what would you would experience fasting, but mm-hmm. it allows you to do it for longer because you're still getting some of those essential nutrients. But yeah. I, I, I just have concerns about somebody following that approach you know, indefinitely for the rest of their lives because there's not a single example that I'm aware of of an ancestral population that only ate animal foods with no phytonutrients at all. And then just the research that's coming down the pipe on phytonutrients and their benefit and importance to health is makes me cautious about that for sure. Oh, totally. And I, I think, you know, it's also not just what you're eating, it's what you're not eating, right? So if you're not yeah. eating plants, you're not having gluten, you're not having all these other things that could be potentially irritating to your gut. And, and so, yes, sometimes I do take people off a lot of plant foods when I'm trying to heal autoimmune disease. I take them off grains and beans. I I do the 10 day detox diet, which essentially is an elimination diet. And that really works really well. So I think it's really about personalizing the approach, figuring out what you need. But, but, you know, the, the, the fact that, that uh, you and I sort of agree after looking at all the research is not a surprise. I mean, the data is the data. And if you take, if you take a dispassionate look at them, that's not ideologically based, then you can actually you know, come up with pretty similar conclusions, right? I, I you know, That's I always right. say, don't let your ideology run over your biology. Like I have a friend who's a vegan and we just, we just did his blood test and it's like, I mean, he's a 50 year old guy, but he's, you know, he's, he exercises, he's, he eats healthy foods, you know, doesn't eat junk, but he's severe anemia. He's iron deficient. He's got severe B vitamin deficiencies. He's got significant vitamin D deficiency. You know, uh, he's got um, probably uh, EPA and DHA. Oh my God! He's supplementing he, with yes, that. he was. He said he was supplementing with this product, and this is an example. He sent me the package. It's like, oh, this is a plant based form of EPA and DHA with like a thousand milligrams of EPA and DHA. And I'm like, it's kind of suspicious because I've been doing this a long time and I don't really know how that works. Like, okay, you can get algae and get DHA, but you can't get EPA. And right. like, I just was confused, but I'm like, all right, well, let's just check. Cause I'm like, if you found something, let's hope it works. And it was like, yeah. his, he was like zero, like zero EPA DHA. And I'm like, yeah. God, you know, it's marketing. It's, it's, it's just not true. And so he's, he's have, he has all these significant nutritional deficiencies. I was like kind of shocked to see it in someone who was so conscious about their diet. He wasn't a junk food vegan. Totally. Uh, no, you know, we, and- we, like, 
we used to do, you know, I, for a while in my clinic, uh, we had a way that we would onboard new patients where they would do a blood test before they even came to see me in person so that I yeah. had the, the test results. Yeah. And so I would see the, the results before I saw the patient or heard anything about their complaints or what they were up to or their history. And over time, I began to be able to recognize, oh, this is a vegan. This is, a ve you know, this is a vegan's blood work. This is a vegan's blood work <laughs> right. because I would see the same constellation of patterns, you know, low yeah. B12, low anemia, iron deficiency anemia, low EPA and low DHA, low zinc, you know, et cetera. Yeah. And of course, that's not true for all vegans, but there is definitely a higher risk of those kinds of deficiencies happening in those situations. All right. Amazing. So let's talk about, let's talk about what the most nutrient dense foods are, because I think people are going to be surprised by this answer. What are the most nutrient dense food on the planet? <laughs> yeah. Organ meats, liver, yeah, liver number go. one. So, so this was, um, Ty Beal, who's actually, uh, St Stefan Van Vliet, and Ty Beal and some of these new uh, researchers who are, who've been studying the uh, nutritional value of uh, pasture-raised animal products and animal products in general. And this is this was a study that was published in Frontiers. Uh, it was early uh, spring of this year. It was Ty Beal and Flaminia Ortenzi, and they work for an organ. Uh, uh, I think it's an NGO, but it's an organization that's con that's trying to address star uh, hunger and starvation around the world and, and mm. malnutrition around mm. the world. And so mm. their goal was to figure out what are, what's, where, where can we get the biggest bang for our buck? You know, if we're going to like find foods that we want to give to the people who are suffering from malnutrition around the world, what should we give, give them? Should we be giving them beans? Should we be giving them healthy whole grains? I'm doing air quotes here for, for someone that's not watching. Should we be giving them, you know, lots of kale? Like what, what is going to make the biggest difference in their nutrient yeah. levels? Yeah. And so they created, they created a scale to assess the nutrient density of these foods. This study was unique compared to all previous research that's been done on this topic in that it was the first one to actually quantify and consider bio, the bioavailability of a nutrient. Oh, yeah. Very important. Because, yeah. for example, if you look on, on paper, you can see that spinach contains a lot of calcium. So you think, oh, if I just eat a cup of spinach, I'll meet my calcium needs for the day. That's not the case because spinach also contain, contains Oxalates. oxalic acid, yeah. which inhibits the absorption of calcium. So you only absorb 5% of yeah. the calcium in yeah. spinach, yeah. whereas from like uh, dairy products or you know, bone-in salmon or or even um, cruciferous vegetables, it'd be closer to 30%, right? Yeah. So, so they actually considered bioavailability, which was a landmark uh, effort. I'm so happy to see a paper that finally did. Now, the top 10 foods, five of those top 10 foods were organs. So you yeah, have amazing. liver, kidney, heart, spleen, and pancreas. Wait, and what about thymus? I like the thymus. Green, I like the thymus. Thymus wasn't on there. Those are sweet breads. It's, I, I don't love actually that. even know. Yeah. Oh, God. I went on a date All once and I, and I said, hey, want some nuts. sweet breads? And she's like, sure. And she didn't really know what it was. And I'm like, she thought it was bread. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> like, a, yeah, like a muffin or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, you know, so those five foods, and then you have shellfish, uh -huh. uh, small dried fish, dark leafy greens, so uh -huh. like kale, collard greens, yeah, et cetera. Yeah. And then vitamin A rich, uh, vegetables, like the yeah. brightly colored, you know, red peppers, yeah. uh, yellow peppers, et cetera. Those are, that's the top 10 nutrient dense foods. But it's, but it's interesting if you, if you, anybody wants to just Google like nutrient, uh, profile of liver compared to, let's say nutrient profile of the most amazing vegetable you can ever think of, like broccoli or whatever, kale, whatever you think it yeah. is. And yeah. it's like, it's like an Olympic athlete versus kind of a high school player. It's like that is Weekend a different. Warrior. It's like it's such a massive <laughs> amount of scale difference. It's like the graph is here versus here. You can't really see my hands, but it's like on the podcast. Yeah. It's like really different. I'll, and and I'll it's give such you some, a, I'll give you a, yeah. We, we quantify that. So in this scale, um, lower was better. So like a, a, a score of one would have been the most, uh, you know, the highest score you dense. could get for nutrient density. Liver had a score of eleven. Um, even other organs were like in the 40s, 50s, 60s. Yeah. And when you started to get into like 
dark leafy greens, which are amazing, super nutrient dense. They were more like in the hundreds. And then you wow. had like whole grains were in the thousands. Wow. And then, you know, then they had like um, processed and refined flour. It was just not even on the chart. It was like, you know, it, it, they couldn't even quantify. They couldn't, it couldn't be in the same scale because yeah, they, yeah. they were so devoid of nutrients. And now that's 60% of the calories that the average American consumes is from ultra processed food. So true. we wonder why we're suffering from an epidemic of nutrient deficiency. No, no, there's two points I want to also come up with the, about the liver thing. First is like people are listening to, ooh, but I mean, I'm Jewish. So I grew up on like chopped liver. So I, and we were really poor. <laughs> I lived in a, in a one bedroom apartment with my mother and every night we'd have like ch chicken livers and onions. I thought it was a gourmet meal, but it was the Lucky cheapest thing you. she could get. Cheapest thing she could get. But, but uh, one of the, one of the things is like, how do you take it to make it good, taste good? And two, uh, what about the toxins in liver? Because people are thinking about this yeah. thing. Oh, well, liver is basically your detox organ. So are you just yeah. getting all these nutrients, but you're also getting all these toxins? Can you talk about that? Yeah. So that's a common misconception. But we'll start. We'll we'll start there, and then we'll go back to how to prepare it. So the liver is is the organ that processes toxins, but it's not the organ that stores them. And that's the key difference. So the, actually the storage um, of toxins in our body happens in our fat tissues. So um, th if you, this is why if you eat you know, animal products it's, and you're eating like dairy products, which is pretty high fat, it's very important to get pasture-raised you know, organic fed. products because any toxins that those animals are exposed to are going to be stored in the fat tissues, not in the liver. So yeah. that's pretty easy to, you know, to, it is a common misconception and it's not really a concern. In terms of making it more palatable, there are a lot of ways to do that. Um, you know, one is the, the probably the simplest and most straightforward is, and this is what I often tell to my patients, is like take it two, three ounces of liver chop it up, add it to ground. If you're having, let's say ground beef, a pasture raised ground beef, and you put some Mexican seasonings in there and to make, you know, tacos or something like that. Most people are not going to even be able to detect that there's, that there's liver in there and you don't need a lot because it's yeah. so nutrient dense. You only yeah. really need one or two servings of, you know, three ounces of liver a week to get the full yeah. value. So that's, yeah. that's one way to do it. Um, just uh, some people cook it in milk. That's like an old, um, I'm not sure what culture that came from. You know, milk has some other issues, maybe not a good idea for some people, but if you tolerate dairy, you could consider that. Uh, adding it to like meatloaves, like a yeah. grain-free kind of meatloaf is another way to do it. But you should probably be telling us, Mark, because it sounds like you grew up eating it all the time. <laughs> well, listen, I love chopped liver, but that's not for everybody, especially on a bagel. But anyway... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the, the, how, the, you know, the, how, the chicken how, liver and onions you get organic organic chicken yeah. livers and you and you stir fry onions yeah. and you put uh, the chicken livers in and stir fry them and you serve it it's so good uh yeah and pate is another great way to get liver and you pate. can put on like you know flax crackers i i actually um you know re really like it and, and i went to this uh, another blue zone sardinia and, and, and they serve the whole yeah. nose to tail thing. This guy had this pig and he was like, listen, we flavor the meat before we kill the animal, meaning we feed it all these phytochemical rich plant foods, acorns, carob and wild wow. this and wild that. And it, it was so amazing. And he, and he was so excited about preparing this pig meal. I don't really eat that much pork, but I was like, okay, well, this guy made it for me. And, and, and he served like all the different parts. And then one of the things he had this whole dish of organs, it was like spleen and liver and lung. And I was like, Oh, I don't want to eat lung before, but I guess I'll try it. <laughs> and it was actually pretty good. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, all right. So, but you know, I actually, I met this guy, Chris, a, a quite amazing guy. I was, um, and my favorite sauna place is a Russian bathhouse, Russian Turkish bath in New York City. You took me there. Uh, we went I did, there today, I did. I remember? I, I did. You. It did. It was so good. That was great. And, uh, and this guy's like, hey, are you Dr. Hyman? I'm like, yeah, yeah. He's like, oh, wow, I love your stuff. But, you know, I want to tell you what I'm doing. I'm like, what? And he's like, I'm, I have this company called Mighty Meats. I'm like, okay, well, what is that? He says, well, we make organ meat hamburger. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So he's going to send me some. I'm going to try it. I don't have any affiliation with the company, but I, have. I was like, yeah, that's great. And have you heard, so have you heard of this now, mighty like, meat? Have you heard of this company? I have. Yeah. yeah. And it's just it's really cool samples. guy. It's great. Yeah. There's, there, there are more and more like, um, Epic, you know, has some, yeah. if you go to Whole Foods and you get, they have bar, you know, meat bars and some of yeah. the bar, the meat bars have liver. 
in them, um, you know, mixed with bison or, or beef or whatever. And so that's another good way to get some liver in your diet if you're having trouble cooking it or preparing it on your own. Now, what about the supplements that they have with organ meat pills? Like, it sounds kind of weird, but I'm like, is that, is that, is that yeah. work? That's that that works for sure. Uh, I I have an organ meat supplement because I found in my um, many years of working with patients, I could only get a very small percentage of people to actually eat the organs. Uh, yeah. Liver is one thing, but then spleen and kidney and pancreas, you know, that was a whole nother. I just saw like game. kidney bean pie. That was good. Beef and kidney yeah. pie. Remember that? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, but but yeah, and then heart. You know, heart is is kind of i call it the gateway organ meat because yeah. it's it's a little easier for people to eat but it's technically a muscle it's not actually an organ and it doesn't have the same nutrition it has, it's loaded with coq10 which is great but it doesn't have the same nutrient profile that liver and kidney and and spleen have so yeah um yeah the organs you want you know obviously you want them to come the supplements to come from 100 percent grass-fed animals we we use uh source from New Zealand, uh, where I think the, the cattle are just exposed to far fewer toxins, no GMOs, no antibiotics, no growth hormones, none of that stuff. And then, you know, it's just basically the organ meats, they're, they're raw, and then they're frozen. And then they are dried. And then that, that powder is what's in the capsules. So Amazing. it's about as close as you can get to eating organ meats without actually eating them. So, That's amazing. Um, well, you know, it's interesting. This is not a, you know, a surprising thing. When you look at, uh, you know, animals like lions, they, they eat all the yeah. organs and then they leave the meat yeah. for all the scavengers. Uh, and, right. you know, and then you see, you see, uh, you know, like Native Americans also do the same thing. If anybody saw Dancing with Wolves or The Last Mohican, yeah. and they, they go like to eat the organ, eat the liver, you grab it and that's what you eat first. So it's like the delicacy. Yeah. So I, th the I think- The highest status people got the organs, right? Exactly, exactly. Well, yeah. all right. So so let's talk about what you've done, Chris, because you know you and I have been in this business a long time and it, it is frustrating to try to find the right supplements, to find the best products, to to know what's good. To, people are confused. And you know even, even myself, who have been in this business a long time, I really have to- you know, do a lot of due diligence uh, before I recommend to my patients this company or that company. And then even then I go like, I don't know, are they doing what they say they're doing? And, you know, it sounds like yeah. good in the marketing, but like you, you decided to create a, a supplement company called Adapt Naturals. And, and, and it's quite, it's quite different than other companies. So how is it different than other supplements? And tell us a little bit about it. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Um, so yeah, I've been doing this for 15 years, not, not nearly as long as you, but it feels like quite a while. <laughs> Um, and I, you know, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I waited that long to create a, a supplement line because it, I feel like it took me that long to learn what I needed to learn to, to make something that was actually added value and was different than what was already available. Um, so one of my big motivations was, I think most people are really confused about <laughs> supplements. You know, I, I've seen this over and over people. I ask if everyone I've treated in that 15 year period to bring everything they're taking into the clinic for their first appointment. And you know, Mark, people <laughs> wheel, they, they wheel in a suitcase, you know, full, full of stuff or yeah. four shopping bags full of products. And we start going through them and I'm, I'm just like horrified often by what's, what's in the bag. And people started, you know, their aunt told them about something yeah. nine years ago <laughs> yeah. and they, they, and then they're a doctor and then they watched a summit and they, started four other products and I don't blame them. It's just super confusing to be a consumer in today's sure. marketplace. And, you know, half the time they're just throwing their money away, but some of the time they're actually doing, taking stuff that is causing harm. It's not only not helping, it's, it's actually yeah. causing harm yeah. Yeah. or they're just taking way too much. You know, they're, yeah. they're, they're doing way more than they need to be doing. So I set out to, to just give people a simple, but super effective plan that they can follow on a daily basis where they can get all of the nutrients they need, both essential vitamins and minerals, like we've been talking about, and also the phytonutrients, the bioflavonoids, the carotenoids, the beta glucans, et cetera, and just kind of set it and forget it, right? So I, we created this, what we call the Core Plus Bundle. It's a daily stack of five products. It contains, it's a multi, an organ supplement, not surprising. Um, a mushroom product, eight of the, mo the, the most evidence-based mu edible mushrooms like reishi, chaga, lion's mane, turkey tail, cordyceps, etc. cetera, tocotrienols, and magnesium. Mm. 
And when you put these together, they work in a synergistic way that really just supports all aspects of health. And we're using, again, as uh, won't surprise you, all of the most bioavailable forms of nutrients, mm. methylcobalamin instead of cyanocobalamin, P5P instead of peroxidine, R5P instead of riboflavin, uh, folate instead of folic acid. Yeah. We're using 100% uh, grass-fed organs in the organ product. For the mushrooms, we're using the full extract. So you have all of the terpenoids, the terpenes, the beta glucans, all of the compounds instead of just a simple isolated, you know, isolated nutrients that you get from the mushrooms. We're using delta and gamma tocotrienol. So, yeah. uh, you know, this is the product of my 15 years of research and clinical experience. And I really yeah. put everything I had into creating this because I wanted to give people products that they could really trust. That's so great. I actually can't wait to try them. I want to get them. <laughs> Are they available? You'll get them. How, how do people they're get available them? now? Yeah, they, they're available now. So adaptnaturals.com, uh, the core plus bundle is what we recommend. And, you know, Mark, we've been talking this whole time about how important a healthy diet and lifestyle is. Uh, you and I always have said this, we, you cannot supplement yourself out of a bad diet and lifestyle. No, so I don't know. That, and, and I put, you know, my money where my mouth is. We built an app called Core Reset which has recipes, meal plans, shopping lists, guided stress management, audio mm -hmm. videos with me and other guests, movement programs. Like I wanted to give people everything they need to just follow a program for a month and get as healthy as possible. And that should always be the foundation. Like don't take my supplements if you're and just expect that you're going to be able to eat, keep eating pizza and cheese and cheese doodles and stuff. You have to make well, those other yeah. things too. I mean, that's why they're called supplements, not that's replacements. Right. <laughs> yeah. So we, so we built this app and we're giving it away for free to anyone who buys the bundle. Like that's how serious I am about this diet and lifestyle being absolutely critical to this process and we didn't want that to stand in the way we wanted to make it super easy for people to make those changes and you get the app for life you can keep it uh it's free if you order the bundle there's That's lots great. of great content in there if you love that last video you're gonna love the next one check it out here we are light years ahead in our uh, refined understanding of not just calories but how the body processes what you put into it it's kind of like fuel you got a nice car if you're actually putting good quality engine oil 